welcome back. Hope you got a moment to uh, step away for a second, get a get a glass of water or something like that, because we got a really great presentation coming up here for you in just a minute. We're going to give everybody about 60 seconds or so uh, to kind of get back to their desks and get, get ready for this uh, great session, which is going to be one of the last of our day of the day today. Uh, just a reminder that you can add your questions in our chat and we will save some a few minutes of time at the end to uh, talk through them. So we'll just give it just a, another 30 seconds or so. All right, everybody. Well, listen, we're going to go ahead in the sake of time and get get going. I'd like to turn it over to Ugo and Bomzi that are going to present to you about connecting the dots, Red Hat Service Interconnect as a modernization enabler. Turn it over to you guys. Perfect. Thank you very much, Greg. We really appreciate this uh, opportunity to be able to talk about um, very interesting topics like uh, application modernization, service interconnect, connectivity challenges. Um, that's something we have been uh, looking and trying to uh, help out customers around this. Um, so today with me, Bamsi uh, is going to be able to um, to talk about this topic. So Bamsi, welcome. Hey, uh, thanks, Hugo. Bamsi Ravla, technical marketing. Uh... Some of you have been in a pre one of some of the previous sessions. I was I was doing a session on API management and service interconnect, but uh, this is a whole new different topic on modernization and how service interconnect uh, will help out. So yeah, for people who are uh, rejoining, welcome back. For uh, people who are joining new, thank you for joining and hope you guys like it. Yeah, I remember that people will be able to see this uh, recording as part of the YouTube channel for uh, Red Hat developers uh, as part of the Dev Nation event. Well, we really appreciate that you're with us today. Any questions, put it in the chat. We're going to be able to uh, uh, chat with you about um, uh, these topics, try to answer any of the questions. We'll go over some slides, and we also will want to show you a quick demo on, on these topics. So um, yeah, let's get started. And yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, modernization and why is it important right now? We know that there has been a trend and some changes and shifts on the way we have been developing applications in the last couple of, uh, of years. Uh, now it's almost two decades since uh, microservices uh, slammed the door and, and, and get into, as well as then Kubernetes came on, 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 on to play. And now it's uh, containers and... Uh, uh, modern application development that we're covering today, right? But um, if you're not like a brand new company, if you are already, you know, you already have a, a set of assets in your organization that you need to, you know, move forward, be able to get the most of these uh, new uh, new um, paradigms and be able to get the benefits of the of the scale of economy, uh, how you can, you know, uh, get into that into that journey. Uh, there are different kind of strategies, right? The, uh, the the first one you can do lift and shift. The shift you can just you know start to move your application from one platform to another. Do some kind of uh, refactoring, or uh, being able to start ex start to extend your current applications and augment through uh, different layers we call anti-corruption layers, facades, as well as the capabilities of your microservices that help you out to easily move the parts that are more important for your business. One of the things that we used to work in the past is that um, we had everything running on a single instance, on a single server, on a single data center. And, and, and that really uh, uh, was um, had some, some benefits as, as well as some limitations and challenges. Um, that you know, microservices now with the new um, uh, infrastructure uh, capabilities are, are are making it easier to to work with, and obviously you can you can always do that a full rewrite, a full replace, and start from scratch to uh, recreate 
um, most of the fun functionality without all the technical dev and uh, become part of a big bank. However, if you do a big bank rewrite, the only thing that guarantee of it's a big bank. So you need to be aware that, yeah, even though it's an option, even though you can't work with that, uh, if you're really thinking, I'm going to rewrite everything from scratch because I don't want to continue using that ugly Ruby or Rails that used to be so old and I want to do all the all the things on Go and Rust, yeah, it's it's it's, it's something you can do, but it, it requires a lot of, uh, of, of management. But usually what you do is you have a, a, a approach that goes uh, in, in, in a more um, steady uh, uh, way, right? You're going to be running a marathon for moving your um, your monolith to your new microservice architecture. It's not going to be a quick sprint. It's going to be uh, very demanding, and very only uh, only a few people in in the world can really achieve and be champions of that. But the marathons, everybody's running marathons, so uh, we can see that that means that there's something we can uh, achieve uh, more easily. And, and this is one of the things that we have seen. And and if you have read uh, books like. Uh, Monolith to microservices from Sam Newman, or you can you have read the modernization of enterprise uh, job applications from Marcus Arden and Tale Binto, one of our guys in, here within Red Hat. You see that the transitional approach into decomposing functions make it uh, more easy to move into these kind of applications. So for that, there's a series of steps that we can follow that um, helps us to. Um, being able to get into this path of modernization of your applications. So uh, if you go over the text, if you go by the book, you will find a different combination of these steps, right? Um, you need to get the hands into your monolith or your um, a previous application, identify some logical components. You can start to uh, flatten or refactor those components. You need to check exactly what are the component dependencies. So you start to, you know, make your graph uh, to be able to identify who's calling who, who's depending on who, and so on. Um, the next step, obviously, is start to grouping those components. So you start to separate in, you know, a, a mind map where the relationships and where are the trees and, 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 and those. Um, and then, and this is the important one, you create an API for a remote user interface. So that, because that's a very important part that sometimes a lot of people neglect when talking about monetization of applications. Because then automatically just, oh, say, oh yes, APIs, oh yeah, that's something that's gonna be remote. I'm using EGBs, I'm using HTTP, and that's enough. And then just go on the six, migrate the component comp like groups to microservices, uh, move components groups to separate projects, make separate deployments. Then those microservices going to microservices are carving them out and carving them out and carving them out, and then repeating the steps six, seven until complete. But as I was saying, there's some caveats on that, and, and this is what we are seeing now. Um, this is an example from the Monolith to Microservices book from Sam Newman. Um, there, where you are, where they're decomposing an application that has certain functionality. So you have the invoicing, you have the payroll, you have the inventory management, user notifications, and uh, this is basically a way to start mapping the, the features and, and the capabilities. And one of the interesting thing points here, and, and this is the one in, in red in the diagram, it's the calls that we want to intercept inside the monolith. So basically, you know, uh, it could be just, you know, sockets or memory calls or, you know, something that we used to do uh, within the same deployment or the same service. Um, but it's not the, just the only one. So when we're talking about monoliths and for example, Java uh, written, uh, applications written in Java, um, those kind of communication between services, it's not just APIs, it could be um, AGBs, um, enterprise Java beans, session facets, um, RMI, Corba, perhaps. And it is not just REST and, and so There are different other protocols that um, were available there. And when we start to strip down or when we start to carving out all those feature functionalities, we might need to still be able to uh, reuse some of those uh, connections and being able to establish a way to uh, interact with the, within those services. So what we have in the next slide is that 
yes, there's like this process when you start to have an asset, moving to microservice, doing a redirect of the calls. But the important part, and, and this is where the rest of this session um, actually will be focusing more on, it's on the upper part, the part that if, if you notice, there's there's nothing that are connecting those um, those aspects, and, and this is because there are different strategies on how to solve this uh, this uh, this part. On yeah, when when I'm handling the call that is going into my application or my applications, depending on if we are already on the left on, on the right side or the left side of this uh, modernization strategy. Um, yes, most of the modernization approaches that you will hear or that you have heard about in, in the past where we have a lot of great tooling within Red Hat, like uh, migration toolkit uh, uh, of, for applications as well as, uh, as other capabilities and the books and everything goes mostly on, on the features and the code and the, and, and the functionality, the domains, et cetera. But the connectivity part um, it's something, as I was saying, the step four that we uh, were reading in the past, it, it, it's very important. It is, it, is, um, uh, it is important and sometimes it is underestimated because there are different challenges that puts us in, in the spot that we need to be able to uh, uh, overcome. And yes, this is because applications usually when we are we really want to get the most of these new infrastructure trends of these new platforms and cloud that are available for us. It's because there are a mix of environments. We will love to see that everything it's heterogeneous and everything will have the exact same um, uh, uh, type of infrastructure, but that's not reality. Most of the times when we were working in our application that was running locally on our own data center, even there, we used to have different versions of the uh, of the uh, Linux systems, right? Perhaps RHEL six, or the old RHEL fives. Somebody was already deploying it to RHEL nine, or using other kind of Linux systems, uh, Unix systems, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, but if even though you have moved uh, to, uh, if you go to the previous slide, you already have moved into this uh, infrastructure uh, with the different uh, Kubernetes versions with the different um, uh, multiple versions of OpenShift, multiple uh, of, of, of versions of Kubernetes and, and different access to different services like uh, mainframes and all Unix systems, that makes it uh, complex. So that means that um, it is not gonna be the exact same way to connect because the infrastructure and the networking and all these applications are, will be running on different infrastructure. And why is it that? It is because by default, most of the times you will need to live with the reality that we are in a hybrid cloud world. I was actually uh, chatting with a with a with a with, with a with a team of uh, of a customer that uh, was mentioning that um, they were in the betting sports systems and and they were mostly uh, deploying all their um, infrastructure and their applications into wonderful cloud providers. However, because of some reasons uh, related to compliance, they had to have some of the services running in a different cloud provider. And even though they were trying to go like all in one, just one cloud, the reality was that um, they were not being able to do that. Um, and then there are other reasons why your organization might uh, require to have more than one provider. It could be security and compliance if you're in a highly regulated industry where you need to uh, have restrictions of where your data um, it, it's located or where you are, uh, your uh, customers or your access can be uh, enabled. Uh, it could be just because you need uh, IT agility, right? The people that you're working on, the services or the, the vendors that you're working on are using one cloud or another flexibility in case of like this uh, customer that wanted to um, really get into uh, into the benefits of, of the other cloud provider. Um, data gravity, it's one of the major things where we have seen that people are not able to just, you know, move into cloud or move into from one cloud to another because 
um, sometimes when we're talking about big databases, terabytes of data, your your data lakes, um, it, it sometimes becomes more um, costly to just move the data than just keep it running where they are. So there are different different uh, different reasons. Mergers and acquisitions sometimes put us in in, in this kind of a scenario. So moving just applications is it's it's something possible, but most of the times we're going to be living on this um, hybrid world. And what we were saying, okay, if we are living in a hybrid world, if we need to be able to deploy applications on these different uh, clouds, different providers, what are the options? What are the choices that I have as an architect to define how we're going to be working with those? And I would say that there are options. That means that there are different ways to uh, tackle this problem. And it will depend on, on, on how you're working, what are your uh, constraints, right? Um, we can always go with public IP networks um, where you are going to be, you know, um, um, implementing load balancers, IPs that are going to be available for your services. And, but that's costly, right? It's, that's something that um, sometimes it's limited to. So it is one of the approaches. You can set up your own VPN network and you can have network isolation, um, but you will need to handle all the different rules because everyone is going to be looking at everyone on, on both that segment. You need to check, okay, ports, what the ID, IPs that I need to go with, uh, with the uh, privilege that I have as password of the network administration to reconfigure the network after that and, and so on. But but if you are uh, instead going with the provider from, uh, from, from the cloud that also provide, that gives you a solution that tries to isolate networks like a, like a BPC, um, it's, it's also something that you can do. You can go over and uh, perhaps go on, on cluster privilege to be able to enable those permissions, being able to keep track of every single that one of those. Perhaps you get the benefits of some um, infrastructure of a, as, a, as, a, as code, but again, it's still something that costs you uh, money that also uses resources and you will need to have dedicated uh, team. And what we are proposing with this session is that you can also uh, try to try and, and give it a look to the overlay network or, or the band, the, the virtual application network that gives you um, uh, against network isolation, uh, but fine grain at uh, layer seven that uh, removes some of the complexity of how you are handling the connectivity between your, uh, your applications um, where you um, also remove friction and how uh, non administrators uh, can uh, configure and, and, and access to the services depending on, on their privileges uh, built on top of what your network stack completely goes from physical layer to um, all, all the way to the application. So this is the kind of proposals that we have for hybrid cloud. And we will start with a simple scenario, right? So we do have a um, application running on your data center and Red Hat Enterprise Linux, where we have certain um, aspects of the application uh, already uh, decompose, right? So we have been able to extract the database into one place. We have been able to uh, break out the some of the logic of the application that we have a payment process or service that it's already um, extracted as, as an independent application. And we have a very nice, decent, modern UI uh, living also in their own uh, application. And, and this is how it works, and, and this is how we want to deploy it. However, when we decide, for example, to go to a cloud provider, say the number one cloud provider, and and in in and, and deploy our application there because we want to get the benefits of the reach that they have, the presence of uh, of our application in um, in in the caching, and and the possibility to uh, uh, make it very fast to deploy, right? However, because of um, restrictions, as we mentioned on the on the data that we can uh, move into the cloud or because of the way that we are um, working and handling our services right now and, and, and the budget, we need to keep some of those in the data center. So 
if we want to connect both clouds of being able for the uh, uh, UI to be able to access information in the database as well as information in the uh, in the uh, uh, payment service, um, what, one of the usual approaches is, uh, for example, exposing um, APIs, right? Uh, creating an, an API gateway and then open some ports so the uh, application then can connect and then access the web service that it's running the payment service. However, uh, because API gateways usually uh, work at the uh, HTTP level, HTTP protocol, um, if you want to access the database, you are not uh, going to be able to tunnel just uh, uh, through the HTTP um, a connection to a database uh, unless you're using TLS, but that means that you will need to enable TLS on the database as well as the application, but you are not using that because you cannot change all the code. So what you end doing is just creating a REST to database uh, service that will handle those kind of, of approaches. If you notice, we uh, have two different pieces new added to the uh, to the solution that needs to uh, be managed, needs to be deployed, needs to be built in one of those cases. And your architecture becomes more and more complex of what you really want to do that was in the next slide, just to behave the exact same way it was behaving before, but just deploy on different networks and different data centers, right? So, because at the end, it's the exact same application that we are working on. So how can we achieve this? How can we get back that feeling of working in a single data center, uh, but at the same time, um, having those uh, deploy and independently? And this is where service internet helps us in easy four steps. So we have two clusters. Uh, we have service A and service B deploy, and we can do it with uh, four easy steps. So the first one is we will need to init uh, service interconnect using the Scoper CLI, and that will deploy um, the routers on each one of the cluster that will help us out to um, establish connections and connectivity between the sites and being able to manage the services over there. One of the clusters needs to have a public endpoint to be able to create this connection. Um, one of the interesting things here is that uh, we will be able to establish a bi-directional connection even though uh, it's only one of the clusters that is exposing services. So in one of the clusters, we're gonna create what we call a token that will help us out to um, get the credentials requirement for the other cluster to be able to take that token and then create the link between those services by providing the mutual TLS communication between the routers using these tokens that uh, include some certificates to be able to uh, guarantee the identity of the uh, route that is connected. So we create the link using that token. Next thing then, when you already have the, uh, the connection established between two clusters, the next thing is to be able to work at the uh, service level and being able to uh, expose what service we want to use. And this is because um, in the opposite of other kind of solutions that automatically expose everything um, that it's connected to uh, the same name space or the same network segment, um, uh, service interconnect works in a way that it is more like an allow list. We need to explicitly tell the network which services we want to expose to the network so they are being shared across all the different uh, clusters connected. In this case, we only have two, but we can have a mesh or, or uh, sorry, a, a, a connection a connection uh, set that has more than, than two clusters, three or four clusters. And we can do that with just uh, scope exposed deployments and the deployment will create the service that will be uh, exposed into the other into the other clusters. So the um, next step is uh, for uh, BAMSI to show us how all this works in real code. BAMSI, are you ready? Sorry, I was talking on mute. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Absolutely. Go for it. So thank you, Hugo. That was that was great setup, right? Uh, for for the demo itself, uh, what we are going to do is 
uh, as as hugo mentioned we'll see how what are the different scenarios or connectivity challenges or uh, use cases that an organization will face when they are trying to you know go to uh, while modernizing their applications breaking down them down into microservices and uh, you know deploying them across the hybrid cloud so the first thing first things first is is actually creating that hybrid connections irrespective of the environment your services are deployed in they should all feel like they're deployed uh, as in the same environment without exposing your services directly to internet and that is one key capability of service interconnect so in our case uh first we have the we have a patient portal application that is deployed in on an open shift cluster in aws cloud and then we have a database and a payment processor that will, that has a the payment the database has a list of patients and the payment processor has uh, is used to make uh, bill payments by the patients so both these the front end is in the open shift cluster and uh, the the, the database and the payment processor are in the rel data center and let's see how we can create that overlay layer 7 network uh, using uh, red hat service interconnect so uh, jumping directly to the demo if you can see you should be able to see three different uh, terminals here the green one is for aws the blue one is for azure which i'll cover uh, again uh, uh, soon but uh, uh, and the orange one is for the rel environment and and they are the both the database and the uh, the payment processor are deployed at containers and that's not a necessary for the connectivity but for for this demo i've deployed them as containers you can see the page the patient processor and the patient portal database both are deployed using podman and now let's go ahead and start creating the connections so first things first, I, before I start creating the connections, I'd like to show you the patient portal front end. This ideally, once we create the connection to the database, it should show a list of patients and doctors, and eventually we should be able to click on a patient and try to make some bill payments and uh, you know go through different scenarios, how service interconnect can help in you know uh, the modernization journey of this application. Yes, we are not showing how we are breaking the monolith to microservices here because that's not the scope we are focusing on the connectivity and uh, some other parts of uh, some other modernization challenges that come okay so let's what i'm going to do is uh, in this aws cluster here uh, the open shift on aws i'm going to initialize the first let me check if i am on the AWS project, yes, that confirms it. I'm going to initialize the scupper router in this, the service interconnect router using the scupper CLI. And I'm copy pasting some commands so that, you know, in the interest of time uh, and so that, you know, we don't make any silly errors and uh, keep debugging it. So bear with me there. And it'll take a few seconds to initialize the scupper router. And then we also check in which mode uh, we also initialize a scupper router in the rel machine. There you go. And let's wait for it. It should initialize. And uh, I think it takes a couple of a minute or so sometimes due to connectivity, but let's let's wait for a second or two. I see. Yes, Copper is installed in the lab user on the rel machine, and now let's go ahead and create the token. Right. The most important thing is to go uh, as as Hugo mentioned in 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 his slides that we have to create a token in order and exchange that token so that we can create the connectivity between the routers. So I'm going going ahead and creating the token. That token again takes a uh, a few seconds to create, and once we have the token, let me go ahead and uh, you know display the token. I'll concatenate the token and. Uh, what we'll do is well, I'll, I'll create a file directly on the rel vm uh, and copy the token uh, so and uh, i mean that's our mechanism to transfer for this demo 
but I'm copying the token and I'll go ahead and create the same token on my virtual machine. Uh, let me go ahead and copy the token again. Copy. And that should be it. Now, hopefully we didn't make any errors while copying the token. Now, since we have the token in both our environments, let's uh, jump into our REL machine and try to create the link. So the site is configured and scupper link is created, as you can see. And then once uh, you see, I can go ahead and check scupper status here. Just a second. In these comments, I think there's some network issue at my home, but uh, they should be pretty instant. So let's go ahead and check if the connectivity is established. Again, forgive me for the connectivity issues at my home. Let's forget that. We can we can actually see scupper link status here, and that should work. Scupper link status. Yeah. So scupper link status. Scupper link status. AWS to VM is connected, and that's that's how we know that you know we we have established the, the connection. So once we have the links established, let's go ahead and expose. So, uh, our, you, you know, as uh, as we learned earlier, you have to explicitly expose each service to be available on this uh, uh, layer seven network using Service Interconnect. All the all the services by default are not exposed, so you have to explicitly say Service Interconnect to expose these commands in order for them to work. So I have exposed both the database and the payment processor. Now, since we have established the connection, since we have established the connection, oh gosh, there you go. I think there's some connectivity issues again. Let me go and check my incognito if it's uh, caching something. Mm -hmm. There's something missing here. So let me just check. Uh, have I exposed the database A connection? Yes. Scupper link status. There are no connected links on other sides. Okay, let me just tear down the network quickly so that we can, uh, you know, establish the connections again. There seems to be some uh, some some glitch in my network or some glitch in my configurations. So let me quickly again create, uh, you know, all these connections, right? Let me first initialize the scupper router in AWS, and let me initialize the router again here. Good, that is initialized. And let me go ahead and create the token. Let's wait for the token and then let's remove the secret that we created earlier so that we can create a new one. Going to there might be an issue in me copying the token correctly previously so that might be another issue that you want to look out for so I'm, I'm still going ahead and creating it and let us go ahead and create and expose i'm doing all the steps together so that we don't waste time here so let's go ahead and create and expose and uh, Okay, good. Have I exposed my services now? Let's expose our services again. If that, let's see if that works. Okay. Oh, 
sorry my bad I, I forgot to create a corresponding virtual services in the aws environment and that's why we are not able to see our database and the payment processor so each time when you are especially connecting from a podman site on rel to your aws uh, uh, machine you have to create a corresponding virtual services on on aws for the connections to show up now hopefully the yeah there you go now hopefully the the patient list shows up and let's go ahead and try to make a bill payment for angela martin so let's go ahead and pay and you see here if you look at the processor information it should say it has been processed at the data center it knows that you know the data is coming from the data center and the payment processor is located in the uh, in, the, in the data center. So, so the next step that we'll do here is, you know, we will, uh, what the next step that we'll do here is, you know, we'll, we'll check high availability and failover uh, use cases. What I'll do is uh, we have the, since we have the, in the context of this patient portal organization, right? Uh, that is That is creating this software uh, for uh, hospitals and other healthcare organizations they have decided okay uh, now that we've modernized our application how do i make it highly available how do i deploy my payment processor in some other cloud in case uh, uh, in case there is a high load or in case uh, one comp uh, one of in case you know some, some failure happens so first i'm going to show you a load balancing scenario so what we'll do is uh, as you can see here i'll show you an azure cluster where we have deployed our patient portal payment processor. And uh, I've logged into the Azure cluster uh, here using the blue tab. And I will go ahead and uh, first, you know, uh, create a token on our AWS cluster. So basically I'm going to establish this connection that you see here, let me get a pointer. Establish this connection that you see here. Uh, now those we are going to achieve those steps. So I'm going to create again a token in our AWS cluster. We already have a router created. So let's go ahead and create the token. And let's, let me just double check if I'm on the right project here. I'll see project. Uh, yes, it's an Azure project. So it's on the Azure cluster. And let's initialize the router here on our azure cluster the red hat service interconnect router and uh, there you go the router is there and let's go ahead and create the link between aws and azure right the link is configured it's been linked to our aws cluster and let's expose the payment processor using the scupper expose command. Now we are saying, okay, there is another instance of the to the to the scup to the service interconnect network. We are saying there is an other instance of the payment processor that is there in case high load comes and you want to you know do do uh, if you want to load balance. So I'm going to expose uh, the payment processor that we deployed on Azure. As you can see in the image here, this is what I'm going to expose right now using the command. So let me do that. And uh, let's give it a couple of seconds. Good, and now what I'll try to do is I'll try to make uh, say 100 or say 1000 calls to the payment processor and see uh, how and see how the load is getting distributed between, uh, uh, you know, between the uh, between between the Azure uh, payment processor and the data real data center payment processor. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm initializing a terminal uh, on the AWS cluster to make the call. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call the payment processor internal service, uh, and I'm going to store the results, the responses that it gets in a file. And in, and, and in the file, I'm going to see how many times uh, the, it got a response from uh, the Azure cluster and how many times it got a response from the data center. So let's uh, give it one more minute, or uh, say 30 seconds for the terminal to load here. Uh, we'll use this terminal to make the call. 
so uh, to test the load balancing scenario uh, now that we have as you can see in the slides, we have two, two uh, a replica of the payment processor in Azure Cloud, and it should ideally get distributed. So still waiting on the terminal here. Give it a minute. It usually, I mean, sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. Uh, usually should be a minute or so, but, but sometimes it just takes a couple of minutes. Let's Let's give it that time. Come on, terminal. Or we could jump into the pod and do it directly if needed. Hmm, this is this terminal is testing my patience now. There you go. Okay, now let's check OC project. Uh, OC project. Right now, I'm going to make the call here. As you can see, I'll, I'll make a I'll, I'll make a bunch of calls. Say, um, 100 calls to the payment uh, uh, processor API, and store the results in response underscore result text. And then I will see how many instances of data center and how many uh, uh, how many responses have Azure uh, are, are returned from Azure. So let's go ahead and do that again. Give it a few seconds for the calls to process. We are making hundred calls to to the service here, to the payment processing service here. And now let me see. Let me grab the file to see how how many responses it got from the data center versus how many it got from the Azure cluster. As you can see, the load was evenly distributed. Forty nine of the responses have come from the data center, and fifty one of the responses have come from the uh, from the Azure cluster, so the load was evenly distributed, right? And that's that's what uh, Service Interconnect does. As soon as it sees a new service uh, that uh, a replica of the same service in a different environment, and if it's a part of the network, it will distribute the load uh, in case one of the thing is not able to take it. So we've we've achieved that. And what if you know the payment processor in the rel machine goes down? Will it automatically switch to Azure? It should ideally, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm go, going ahead and going to unexpose the you know the payment processor from the rel machine. What I mean by unexpose is I'm taking out, I'm saying service interconnect to take the payment processor out of this network so that it can just process on the Azure cluster. So let me log into my rel machine and just clear all the commands so that it's easier to see. And I'm going to unexpose the payment processor using the scupper in unexpose command. And once I do that, that should go away. And when I try to make the payment, let's try to again make a payment, log out, and try to make a payment for another patient who we've not made the payment, Jim Halford, bills. And when you try to make a payment, it is processed at Azure. And that's that's the thing, right? And when you uh, again say when you expose the thing uh, back again, it'll it'll say it is processed at, uh, at at real data center. So you that's that's how uh, it it can change based on which uh, on which environment it is accessing the service from. And the next scenario is where you'll actually look for cloud connectivity resilience. What I mean by that is you know. Now we've established, uh, you know, direct connections between, say, our AWS OpenShift cluster, OpenShift cluster on Azure, uh, and also created direct connection between uh, uh, between uh, between our, our REL machine and Azure cluster. So, what if the connection direct connections break? Uh, for example, the network between two clouds goes down. And uh, say, for example, the connection between uh, AWS and Azure goes down. What would happen? So, so Red Hat Service Interconnect will look for any indirect connections, and then route the calls through that uh, uh, through that indirect connections. For example, if you see here, these are the direct the black links, uh, the green links are the direct connections. Uh, and if if some of the direct connection goes for uh, for this legacy app to reach to the service here. It will take the 
so for this legacy app to reach to the bare metal, it has to come all the way through the indirect connections because the direct connections have been broken because of network outage. So it not only gives high availability, uh, enables high availability for the services, it also enables high availability of the network in case one of the links, one of the network links actually breaks. So in our case, well, we already have a direct connection between Azure and AWS. Uh, what we are doing is we are going to cut the connection between Azure, AWS and Azure and see if, uh, and establish a connection between, uh, and see if it, uh, see if it will take the path from rel to azure so for that what we need to do is one break this link and also create the link between the rel data center and azure cloud so let's go ahead and do that so first i'll go ahead and delete the connection between aws and azure let me again clear this the link from aws to azure has been removed and then I will go ahead and create a token for establishing a connection between Azure and VM. Uh, the token is created. And let us concatenate that token so that we can copy, we can create that token to our RHEL machine. And I'm going to copy the token here. I'm going to copy the token, pasting it, and we'll use this token to establish the connectivity. So now let's go ahead and create the link between our RHEL VM and Azure. Fantastic. So what we've done here is we have removed this connection and we've established this connection. Now we have to check if instead of looking for a direct connection between AWS and Azure, uh, the, the, the front end can actually realize that the link is broken here and can take this alternative path. We can test that by, do, by doing two things, right? One is we can say, uh, you can do scupper status on the AWS, scupper status. And uh, it has, if you can read it, Scupper is enabled for namespace AWS. It is connected to two other sides, one indirectly. So it already knows that it has an indirect connection with Azure. So we can also confirm that by making, say, a payment for, uh, let's say, let's choose pick a patient, right? It's Kevin Malone in our case. And uh, let's go ahead and make the payment. You see pay, payment process that Azure, if, if the link was removed, we would have not been able to make the payment. And this is payment processed at Azure because uh, uh, it realized that, you know, there is an alternative path and it can take that path uh, to establish the connections. So that kind of brings us to the end of the demo session. I'd like to summarize the capabilities of Service Interconnect that we used here. Uh, you know, it's it's application focused connectivity. You can virtually connect to services on any platform, make TCP calls or HTTP calls locally uh, without the use of complex VPNs. The connections between the routers that are key for establishing the connectivity are uh, encrypted using mutual TLS. And it's it, it abstracts the application layer. It makes your networks portable. It is agnostic of your environments, IP versions and it enables portability of your applications uh, 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 without uh, you know, taking away the complex, by abstracting out the complexities of the underlying networks. And as I mentioned, it is a layer seven, uh, since it uses layer seven addressing, it is not IP, instead of routing IP packets, it uses application addresses and uh, uh, that uh, it uses application addresses so that even if you move from one environment to other, if the application address remains the same and the IP address changes, Service Interconnect still is able to find the, uh, you know, find the service. And that's how it was able to realize that the payment processor in Azure was also working, right? And uh, it has a console. Uh, for some reason, I've not, uh, uh, you know, 
initialize the console properly. Let us go check if the console is uh, available. Yeah, it's there's some issue with my console today. I think I've been doing it in other session and it's not been working. So, but uh, it has a console where you can visualize all these connections. As soon as you create scupper link create, it, it all the sites will appear immediately. So uh, the console is usually that's that's how you can actually visualize all these things. And it also has an OpenShift operator. Uh, it also has an OpenShift operator uh, where you can you know automate if you're deploying on OpenShift, you can create using simple. Uh, uh, CRDs. And finally, uh, that's there are these are the key takeaways and summaries uh, that from the session. I mean, you've looked at common modernization patterns, lift shift, refactor, augment, and then you've looked also at the steps in modernizing an application. And you've looked at service interconnects role in modernization, right? It solves issues such as connectivity in hybrid cloud, load balancing, uh, uh, and failover, portability, cloud connectivity, resilience, 